Welcome everyone. Today we have uh, Piotr Grochowski. Many of you know him because he was working with us for a few years. He finished PhD last year in the Center for Optical Physics, uh, actually with a distinction. And uh, now he's moving around the world. As you see, he has many affiliations and he's also changing a topic because some of you maybe know that there are closer and closer connections between ultra cold gases and condensed matter. And now we have talked not about ultra cold atoms, but it will be given by Piotr. So Piotr, the screen is yours. So just to comment on this uh, changing of topics, I like, meanwhile, I changed the topic, the research area once again. So right now I'm doing levitated nanoparticles, which are far, far, far away from the ultra cold gases. But today I'm gonna uh, give a talk about the, something that is on the intersection of the solid state physics and quantum optics. And this, the whole talk will be about a single research line, a single paper, in which, which, is, the, uh, which is a collaboration between the experimental group of the uh, Jans Bigert from ICFO and Magic Levenstein's uh, quantum optics theory group at, from the theoretical side. So uh, I'm gonna show you how we use a quantum optical process called high harmonic generation to distinguish between quantum phases in a, a high temperature superconductor. Uh, in this case, it's a bit be a cuprate oxide IPCO. So uh, let me start, before like, I start to present you any scientific stuff, let me show you the people that were uh, engaged in the research. So as you can see, we have, uh, by the way, can you see my pointer? Yes, we see it. Great, so as you can see, we, can, uh, we have three parts. First on the experimental side, as I said, Jens Bigger's group, then Fiori, Fiori Machi Levenstein's group. And we also have uh, two people from the uh, Bar uh, Barcelona Institute of the Material Science that prepared samples for the experiment and characterized them. So let me just go quickly through these people. So like almost in the alphabetical order, Jans, Jans Bigert, Ugaitz Elu, Temistokis Sidiropoulos, to Tobias Steinle, Igor Tjulnev, on, and on the Fiori side, Maciej Levenstein, Utsa Bahat, uh, I always have problems with that, Bata Karia, Marcello Cepina, Tobias Gras, myself, and as I said, like, uh, from the people from the material science, uh, Jordi Alcala and Anna Palau. So um, let bef before I start, let me show you the like brief overview of what I'm going, what we did, and what like this whole thing will be about. So the central point is the this superconductor IPCO, which this abbreviation uh, stands for the uh, yttrium barium copper oxide. So it's like a piece of ceramic basically, uh, which is superconducting below the temperature of like about 90 Kelvins and has a very rich phase diagram that can be shown here. Here, as for example, as a function of the concentration of holes. So basically how much, uh, let's say proportional to the how, how many oxygen atoms on average are in the whole sample and to the temperature. And to, like, to study this phase diagram, we're gonna use the process, which is called the high harmonic generation, which is basically shooting a very short laser pulse into this, uh, into this sample and getting what is reflected and looking for the spectrum of the re reflected light and looking for the so-called high harmonic spectrum, which is basically just like a, <coughs> like a comp of frequencies that are multiples of the, this fundamental pr uh, frequency of the initial pulse. So in order to do it, so first of all, what is the, like the, the main aim of this work in general? So there are many methods to study strongly correlated quantum matter, like these superconductors, but in general, they are like, they're, to be very precise, they're quite hard to construct. And we are aimed to create a quite powerful, all optical, so only using optical pulses, probe to study, let's say, quantum properties of the strongly correlated materials. So that, and so that would be like the new avenue in studies of strongly correlated matter. 
And of course, in the future, to maybe to use this kind of opt short pulses, short, like very strong short pulses to have some kind of uh, only optical control uh, of this light matter hybrid systems to maybe control some competing orders, some properties of this quantum matter. So this is our motivation. And this whole talk will be more or less, I'm not gonna, I'm, at least I'm gonna try not to dwell in deep into some theoretical and experimental details of what exactly was done, but rather to give like an overview of the whole, of every ingredient that is necessary to, to like to create this How long are these light pulses that are used here? What, sorry? How long are these light pulses used here? Uh, 100 femtoseconds. Femto nano? 100 femtoseconds. Okay. More, more or less, yeah. It's like, a, they are coming from this uh, optically parametr uh, parametric chirped pulsed amplifier. So, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so this is like probably state of the art right now. So the ingredients are like, first of all, theory of the high harmonic generation, then some introduction to the high temperature superconductivity, then some, some model that combines both, both of these words. And of course, on the side, experiment to realize what I just said. And then I will go give you well, results of what we found out. So the first building block is the high harmonic generation, this whole process in atoms. So the physical picture that we have in our minds, we have a laser and we shine basically on some cloud of atoms. So initially, like when the laser was first invented, uh, the strength, the intensity of the fields generated by means of like with the help of these lasers was not so strong. So to describe such a system uh, in which the laser field was much smaller than the, this, all of this electromagnetic field inside the atom, so between the nucleus and the, and the electrons going around, uh, one only needed a perturbative approach in the sense that the, this laser field was, could be treated as a, just a, perturb, like as, as a perturbation. And then if one analyzes it, such a, such a, such a problem, one can find out that uh, uh, in the, let's say reflected or scattered light, there will be some multiples of the initial, of the frequency of the initial pulse. However, these uh, multiples, which are called harmonics, uh, the intensity decay with the order of the harmonic. It is due to the fact that this process is, for example, the second harmonic is proportional to like in the, this third, uh, proportional to like two body, two photon processes, and then the third one to the three photon processes and so on. So in this perturbative regime, we have a rapidly decreasing efficiency of the, uh, of the intensity of these peaks with increasing harmonic order. Nevertheless, in 1961, uh, for the first time, uh, the second harmonic was observed using a Rubai laser on a crystalline quartz. And then six, six years later, the third harmonic in a dust was also observed. However, with the advent of the more powerful lasers, uh, one can achieve, uh, one can achieve laser fields that were comparable to the uh, fields inside atom. I say comparable, but like to see this high harmonic generation that in a second, it's nest, it can be only 1% of these fields inside the atom. But let's say this comparable uh, in, comparable to the field inside the atom. And in the 1987, for the first time, people, uh, uh, people saw uh, higher harmonics. So here is the picture of this high harmonic spectrum, the typical one. So we start here, we have a harmonic order. So with the growing energy, here is the intensity of the, of the consecutive peaks. And initially we have the same uh, situa situation as in the perturbative regime. So like as in the per perturbative calculation, we have this uh, decay of the intensity, but then instead of going down, it's uh, this, uh, harmonics uh, stay on some kind of a plateau, which can last for like many, many harmonics going even up to hundreds. And then there is some cutoff that can be evaluated in a semi-classical way. Uh, you, your emitted photons cannot get too much energy basically, like, the, like it depends on the source. So it, 
it's, it took a couple of years to describe this kind of process. So the easiest picture of this uh, high harmonic generations can be described in the terms of so-called three-step model. So it was first uh, uh, it was first described you know, on a semi-classical basis in 1993 uh, by Corcom, and then uh, one uh, and then a couple of months later in a fully quantum way, and the first order is magic. Uh, so what is this process about? So we can imagine that we have an uh, electron that is trapped in a, by some uh, atomic potential or by the Coulomb forces. Uh, and it's in its ground state, it's, it's a bound state, but then we add this uh, uh, changing elect electro electromagnetic field that introduces some, this, this kind of slope. And by introduction of this slope, you can see that uh, this trapping potential uh, allows like the, the say bar barrier that prohibits the electrons from going outside is getting lowered. So there is non-zero probability that this electron tunnels outside the atom, going getting promoted to the continuum. So when it arrives at the continuum, it starts to go um, along this uh, slope and accelerating in the in the vacuum basically. But after half uh, uh, half a pulse later, the, the the electromagnetic field changes, like this tilt is going in the opposite direction, and uh, and uh, and the electron turns back into the direction of the atom. So it goes back into the atom and gets, uh, well, uh, it goes back in where it was in the, in the first place, but with much higher uh, kinetic energy, it recombines, it goes back to the ground state while emitting some extreme, let's say extreme ultraviolet photon. And in general, when you, compute things, you, uh, you realize that uh, in most of the cases, the pulses that are generated by this process are much shorter than the pulses that were, that were causing this change or this, this electromagnetic this slope in here. So this kind of process was like the uh, precursor of the whole field of the uh, at, at the science, meaning that the science that happens at this at the second scale and uh, enabled people to generate super, super short pulses at the level of up to second, even, even, even faster. Um, okay, but that, that was the first, that was the high harmonic generation in uh, atoms. Now we go for solids. So there are like a couple of uh, differences between atoms and solids when it comes to the high harmonic generation. Well, from the side of atoms, electrons occupy it's, it's a finite system. Electrons occupy a discrete set of bound states. And in contrast, in solids, uh, when we have like very large periodic lattice, uh, we have our, the energy levels become like closer and closer to each other. Like the, this, they become super dense and they create energy, energy bands basically. So uh, like one of the like the simplest pictures that we have electrons containing the valence band and which is separated from like the higher energy band, which we let's say call, call a conduction band. So in this picture from the atomic side, uh, atom got ionized and it was promoted to the continuum. So in the solid state system, it cannot happen. Like we can excite the electron, ionize in a sense, but it gets promoted because it resides initially in the valence band. So it's only get promoted to the conduction band. And it leaves, of course, a hole in the valence band. So, because I didn't say anything about the holes, because in atomic case, the mass of the hole that is left by the atom that goes outside is orders of magnitude greater than the electron. So it does not uh, contribute to the dynamics. It just like stays still. Uh, on the other hand, in solids, the electron and hole masses are comparable. So uh, this, the, the, the whole dynamics in the valence band cannot be ignored. So these are the main differences of these of, of this two different systems. But we still can uh, consider high harmonic generation in solids uh, with the same three step model. So here is the picture of that. So the first step is the same. We ionize the electron. So in this case, it means we excite the, uh, we excite, we excite the electron from the valence band. It goes to the conduction band. 
So in the real space picture, it's just like creation of the uh, electron hole pair. Um, then it propagates on the like through the bands, like the, the excited electron uh, travels uh, on the on the upper band and the hole on the lower band. And while going around in the band during the like excitation, basically, they also emit some uh, photons, which are uh, which when it comes to the intensity of this intraband emission is much slow, much lower than interband emission that I'm gonna tell in a second. So at some point, if the everything is matched, the electron can get de-excited and recombine with the hole while emitting again this extreme ultraviolet photon, which causes interband emission, is, which is the main source of the high harmonic like all of the photons that are were scattered uh, from the in the area. position space uh, of course the hole would go in the opposite direction than the electron is that of interest is that important mm, but th at some point they go back <laughs> of course of course and and why they they come back to the to the original position that's where when the uh, recombination is observed Yes, yes, when they go back okay. to the same. Okay. I, I, I'm not entirely sure at this point, uh, but for sure, for sure it can happen that they go back to the same place. Mm -hmm. But mm, the velocities needs to be matched, so probably it's, it's the same place. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> okay, so that was the whole part about the high harmonic generation. Let me go for the introduction from the very beginning about the superconductivity. So in the late 19th century, people were super interested into the low temperature phenomena. It was like build, like there were a lot of new thermodynamic equations, uh, thermodynamics, the whole field of thermo thermodynamics was like super fast, fa like or was growing super fast. And uh, among many people that was uh, involved in this line of research, some people realized that that electrical resistance of some metals, of some uh, well, some metals, should decrease with the temperature. So, with the introduction, in, with, uh, with for example the third thermod thermodynamical law by Nernst, like people realize that maybe they can achieve zero resistance or maybe some finite value of the resistance in the zero temperature limit. And the people that were like most involved in this in this thing was Dewar. Uh, this is the guy that invented the vacuum flask, Fleming and Nernst and so on. So, so um, uh, I mean, the different machinery that allowed for like getting into like lower and lower temperatures so by means for by means of, for example, I don't know, Joule Thompson refrigerator allowed to uh, allowed Heike Kameling Ones, who used a refrigerator built by Linde to liquefy helium in 1908. So it, he managed to go below 4.2 Kelvin. Uh, and only three years later, when he was conducting some research about with, uh, some metals, well, gold and platinum was uh, a bit too expensive for him. So he used mercury and he refrigerated like this, this mercury with the help of this uh, liquid helium. And at some point in 1911, we had like his notebook is still like, can be accessed in the in library, probably somewhere in Netherlands. He wrote quick nagenok null, which means uh, mercury almost zero, which means that the resistance of mercury is almost zero. So you can see Ones in here in the picture with his lab assistant, like around 1911. And here is the plot from this original paper in which uh, suddenly he stops seeing any resistance of mercury. So that was, uh, that was a breakthrough really. And uh, people spent some time to explain why this super, uh, uh, why did this lack of resistance happen? So first, so it happened after the, uh, the quantum mechanics was born, but uh, the first theory that tried to explain phenomenology of this, uh, of this lack of resistance was the theory by uh, London brothers. 
that provided equations that could explain Meissner effect, which is, uh, which is the effect in which the magnetic field does not penetrate the superconductor. Like it penetrates only at small distance, which, which is right now called the London distance. But the real quantum mechanical, uh, quantum mechanical theory came first uh, in 1950 by Ginzburg and Landau, which was like a phenomenological one involving order parameter, some like, it was a combination of the theory of the second, second order phase transitions and the uh, well, Schrodinger equation. And they got, well, not the day, uh, uh, Ginzburg uh, got Nobel Prize in 2003 because Landau died in uh, 1968, I believe. And also with Abrikosov who uh, provided the classification of superconductors. On the other hand, a couple of years later, there was the first microscopic theory of the, uh, of the superconductivity, which is called the BCS theory after uh, Bardeen, Cooper and Schiffer. And they got their Nobel prizes much earlier in 1972. And I'm gonna give you like an overview of how the superconductivity works. So we, let us imagine a, a lattice, like which is a, basically a crystalline structure, in, let's say a, a metal and uh, some electron. And this electron of course interacts with the lattice. So the picture is that it interacts with the excitations of the lattice with phonons, which are like a quasi particles like the collective excitations of the lattice. And then it excites the lattice, like, and these excitations of the lattice also interact with other electrons. So there is effective interaction between two electrons, uh, which is mediated by the lattice. So it's like the, and we call it basically just the electron phonon interaction. And, and these guys, Bardin, Cooper, and Schiffer, realize that to describe such an interaction, the easiest way, well, the correct way is, the, is to consider ex excitations in which two electrons due to this interaction form a pair, so-called a Cooper pair, with opposite, like each of the electrons have, like with respect to each other, they have opposite velocities. And such Cooper pairs, like when you, like, let's say like, it's like in simple words, when you look from distance at them, these Cooper pairs behave like bosons. And at low temperatures, uh, bosons condense, exactly like the, let's say, Bose-Einstein condensate uh, appears in the ultra-cold atoms. And so these Cooper pairs condense at low temperatures. And uh, one of the features of this cond condensate is the, that it's superfluid, namely it can move without energy dissipation. And this is exactly what happens. This, uh, Right now, below some critical temperature, charge carriers can move without energy dissipation, providing lack of resistance. So that was the explanation of so-called conventional superconductors. And in the 1980s, there was like a strong belief that the critical temperature within this BCS theory cannot go above 30 Kelvin. But in June 1986, uh, Alex Miller from IBM, like with his uh, newly appointed researcher, uh, Georg Bednos, they analyzed cis, like samples, ceram ceramical samples that they thought they can give some kind of superconductivity. And like this idea was like, everybody was thinking that this idea was crazy. But in 1986, they got, find out, they found out that the certain ceramic landonite, like L, uh, LB, uh, 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 CO has a critical temperature at 35 Kelvin, which is above what was like previously thought to be possible. And they were awarded Nobel Prize in eight, like one year later. But you can see like how big of a thing in the scientific community it was because like only a couple of months later, uh, there was a call, like American Physical Society meeting in, the, in New York in which they were supposed to talk about the new experiments with new samples. And so over 2000 scientists uh, uh, came, they couldn't fit them all into the uh, conference center. And there were 51 talks and each of the talks was five minutes. And, it was, and after that, after like this whole, uh, let's say a whole night party of scientists, press called it a Woodstock of physics. 
And one of the people, like one of the groups reported that they managed to go above even 100 Kelvins. So it was a real breakthrough. But uh, what, was the, what is the explanation? How we can go above this 100, like above these 30 Kelvins? We need to go be, be, uh, beyond this BCS theory. And the thing is that it's, it's already been like 30 something years and we still have, does not have, we still don't have any good explanation for that. I mean, we have many hints, like we, for example, know that in contrast to this, let's say in, in contrast to these conventional superconductors in which this electron phonon processes like play the dominant role, we know that electron electrons, like the direct electron electron interaction are like much more, in, are much more important in this unconventional superconductors. And we also know that the, let's say the wave function of two electrons are, have very specific symmetry, uh, D wave symmetry. And we have these hints and we try to build a theory based on some like, like dozens of the, of the experiments, including like RPs, like angular resolve photo emission uh, spectroscopy, uh, nuclear magnetic resonance, and so many, many more. But there is nothing like there is no conclusive. Uh, uh, well, there is no consensus of what is the real mechanism behind this uh, high temperature. Uh, Can I make a short comment? Yeah, sure. I just wanted to mention that before the Alex Miller discovery, there was a paper written by physicists from Wroclaw, who is unfortunately no longer with us, Sigmund Galashevich who was a father of a superconductivity and superfluidity theory in Poland, who published a paper about the possibility of the superconductivity in D-wave symmetry of uh, electrons coupled by the photon. Uh, that was what he wrote. He, he, he was working at the time in the Bogolubov group in Dubna. And this, this, this paper is mentioned in his book on superconductivity but somehow it was completely ignored. And I, I think it's, it deserves to, the comment yeah. that it was the first so, idea of the superconductive. And so, there is a word there that it might lead to the very high critical temperatures. Thank you. Uh, so uh, in the future, when I will give this same talk, I will make sure that it, I will put it. Uh, okay, so, okay, we are past high harmonic generation. We are past like the historical overview of the superconductivity, but let me like focus on exactly the, uh, the uh, okay, the, the, the material, the ceramics that uh, was used in the experiment. It's one of the most popular because it's quite easy to create. At some point there was some, uh, uh, there was some uh, article how to create it at home basically. So like many people use it also in the, like the uh, high school labs and so on. Uh, so it's IPCO, as I said, yttrium barium copper oxide. So it's critical temperature depending on the, how many oxygens we plug in uh, is around 90 Kelvin. So it's somewhere in here, for example. It has this kind of a crystalline structure, which looks super complicated, but there is like a general, so we have different layers. So you can see like from the top, there, there is a layer of uh, uh, copper oxide, like CuO, then the layer of the uh, BaO, then CuO2, uh, yttrium and, and so on. But the general consensus after like many years of studies that the, most of the interesting physics happens only at these planes of CO2. Like most of these correlated uh, dynamics that lead to the superconductivity, probably like this, like the, I would say this is a consensus a bit, uh, like happen within this two dimensional plane. So in a sense, this is like a quasi two dimensional material because it's also weakly coupled to like other layers. And the other layers only like provide uh, electrons or holes to like to be, to be at a specific hole concentration basically. And these materials exhibit extremely rich phase diagram as I said before. So, it has a superconducting phase in this place of the, of the phase diagram, as I explained before. So we can say that it has some specific uh, features which can, we can measure and so on. But there is also different, like 
quite interesting quantum phases. We start from the right, from the so-called strange metal, which is just a different name for a non-Fermi liquid. Because a Fermi, within the Fermi liquid theory, we can describe most of the normal phases of metals. And this Fermi liquid is, behaves more or less like just non-interacting fermions, but with some quantitative, a bit and bit of qualitative differences. Uh, and in, the thing is that the strange metal means that we have some deviations from this Fermi liquid behavior. And of course, it's like you need to go deeper into like what it exactly means, what kind of observables you need to measure to say that it's really a strange metal. But this, this is not important. This is just like a strong, probably strong, maybe not strongly correlated phase, but still a quantum phase, whatever it means. Then we have a pseudo gap phase. When, so the gap means that if something becomes a super con, uh, some superconducting, so within this BCS theory, we say that the superconducting gap opens, meaning that in the density states, there is a region in which, uh, in which this density of states is zero. So this is the gap. And pseudo gap means that uh, this region is not zero, but it has some like finite width, finite size. It's not a real gap, so it's a pseudo gap, but it still can exhibit some kind of, uh, maybe not superconducting properties, but like the conduction, the conduction is uh, much higher. It's probably like due to the, let's say, like early appearance of Cooper pairs, not in the whole sample. And then we have an anti-ferromagnetic insulator, which is just, uh, uh, well, it, 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 uh, it's a phase that exhibits an anti-ferromagnetic older, like a nil phase. So you can see this, uh, this, this phase diagram is rich. We are like, with the, within the experiment, we are interested in the, the like, very specific, uh, well, say route through this phase diagram going from the room temperature below the, uh, to the, let's say, to the low temperature in which we have a superconductor and crossing the transition from the strange metal to pseudograph phase. Um, okay, this will th th this looks like a bit a scary slide because it has equations, but this is the model. This is the next step. This is the model in which we combine both the uh, both the let's say uh, solid state uh, physics in the in the form of the Hubbard model and some coupling to the electric field. So we start. Okay, so this, the starting point is always the Hamiltonian. So. This, okay, so we start with the Hamiltonian, which is just a Hubbard-like Hamiltonian. So the purple, uh, the purple term uh, uh, corresponds to the upper band because we, okay, we use two band Fermi-Hubbard model, meaning that we have two bands that are separated by a energy gap in here. So in this realistic, in this, in this, uh, in this uh, IPCO sample, it's around 0 0.2 electron volts. And this band, the shape of these bands are taken from the density functional theory calculation. So like some complicated, uh, very sophisticated stuff. But we just plug it in. And so the shape just describe, uh, describe non, let's say non-interacting fermions, that non-interacting non electrons that live with this excitation spectrum. So the first term is just like a non-interacting Hamiltonian with this particular band stru structure of the first of the upper, upper band. And then the green one corresponds to the lower band. Again, the non-interacting part, just the kinetic energy. And then we have these two terms that correspond to the BCS theory terms, which create pairs of, as, as I told you before, about these pairs of electrons with uh, anti-correlated uh, momenta, but it's within the mean field approximation. So it does two operators times some C number which describes the, st the strength of the, of the coupling. So uh, these terms create these Cooper pairs. And the last part is the coupling to the electric, uh, to the, uh, electric field. So of course it's pro uh, proportional to the strength of the, of the electric field in here. And then it describes processes in which we, for example, have an electron in the lower band excited to the upper band or the other way around. 
or we move uh, electrons uh, like across the uh, across the band. So these kind of processes, uh, uh, like of which the strength depends and on from, the from, from where you get the time dependence for for the gap operators. Uh, I mean, like the, the, we just assume it's time dependent from the uh, from the beginning. And so we just assume that the delta in your equation in your Hamiltonian are given functions. No, there are in a, we, we do the self consistent uh, set of equations, and we just uh, and we just solve them. This is like a semiconductor block equations. Uh. Maybe I'm also a bit lost because uh, mm -hmm. we have uh, this uh, creation and inflation operators in valence and conductance bands, which are also yeah. time dependent. It's in Heisenberg picture. So this is this is wrong. They are not time dependent. Uh, this is in the interaction picture. Yeah. So this in the no, right picture. No, it's not. No, no, it's, it's not. So they are not time dependent. Is there, are not, there is no time dependence. Okay. Yeah, no, no, no. It's just you just mistake. Sorry, Sorry. because I mean there are just too many time dependences. Yeah, too many, too many time dependences. Well, so it can you... also be time dependent with being constant in time. <laughs> just, <it's more laughs> we, just, we just started there like this, is like taken from like the, the full derivation, which assumes that everything is time dependent. At some point, we say this is not time dependent because okay, it's there, not there interaction. Yeah, there, there are no terms that like change this quantity, basically. Okay, thank you. Uh, and we assume that our field, incoming field, has some strength E naught and frequency omega naught. And the coupling to the light comes from the dipole moment and the very connection within the band. And the important thing is that these BCS parameters, the superconducting gap parameters, are time dependent. And in the next slide, I'm going to show you how they are calculated. So we just take I promise this is the last slide with equations. We have a set of 10 two-body correlators, basically uh, like C, C dagger C, C dagger C dagger, and so on. So it gives us uh, 10, uh, 10 equal time two-body correlators. And then we just derive the equations of motions of these uh, correlators just from the Heisenberg equations. And it consists of the set of 10, 10 uh, partial differential equations that we solve numerically. And you don't need to look at this part because it's like two of 10. But like the important part is here in the uh, in the in blue, which are the phenomenological dephasing times. So basically it tells us that how so for T1, for example, tells us how fast populations, so this NC up, NC down, and so on, go back to equilibrium state at a given temperature. And then T2 tells us how fast correlations go, go back to equilibrium, which is like this V, C, and all other like the polarizations and so on, uh, anomalous polarization. So we just solve this equation with a very particular initial state. The initial state is in a such that we choose the Fermi energy, so the level at which we stop filling the bands with electrons at the, in the middle of the lower band. And we put it in the thermal state, like superconducting state, BCS state, with thermally occupied quasi particles at some given temperature T that we keep constant during the whole evolution. And virtually all of the population of electrons initially sits at the lower band. Like on the other hand, in the upper band, we assume that we have only non superconducting state, so just non interacting for, uh, for, uh, electrons, and the population, initial population, is zero. So, with this model, then we just propagate uh, all of the observables, all of these correlators with uh, equations of motions and get relevant observables. Let's say. So, we can ask several questions like within this model. So one of them is that whether superconducting correlations are present during the time evolution in the upper, also in the upper band, or like how they change in the lower band. And because it only happens due to the interaction with light. And the other question is whether we can see it in the high harmonic spectrum. So this is a working progress because this like pertains to the different subject 
uh, which, uh, which, which is basically light induced transient superconductivity. And the other question is that whether with the high harmonic spectrum, whether we can distinguish quantum phases. And we do that, we just check it with the experimental parameters and like compare it with the experiment. So next, here is the like very rough experimental setup. So in the middle, we have the IPCO sample that is connect mounted onto the, on top of the uh, micro refrigerator and kept at the constant, um, constant temperature. Then we shot a very, uh, then we shoot very short pulses that last like 94 femtoseconds with some uh, with intensity of uh, 300 megawatts, uh, milliwatts and some, okay, some frequency. And then uh, by means of the uh, uh, silica based spectrometer, we look for the, uh, uh, I mean, we, they, <laughs> the, the experimentalists look for the, uh, for the, for the spectrum basically. And of course you need to like wisely choose the angle with respect of two of the, all of the crystalline axis and so on to get, like the, to get the best signal to noise uh, ratio, basically. Okay, so here are the results. And let me start uh, to describe the pictures from A to C. So first, uh, you can see the comparison, the, the this high, uh, high harmonic spectra for third, fifth, and seventh harmonic, because uh, the fourth, like all, all of the even, uh, harmonics are prohibited due to the symmetry. This is like not that important, but like they're just not present. And it's, as you can see, confirmed by the experiment. And you can see that the, the room temperature at 300 Kelvins, uh, the seven harmonic is slow, but when it enters the superconducting phase, so below 90 Kelvins, it's exponentially grows. So we can really see the nonlinear uh, response of the system, like at the seven harmonic. So the uh, the figure B tells us how this response is, uh, let's say, harmonic, harmonic intensity changes with the strength of the of the initial pulse, and in all of the cases it grows. And the difference between the uh, room temperature and the low temperature below ninety kelvins is the largest for the for the largest intensity of the laser, as expected. And the third, uh, the first plot, the third plot is the most important one because it describes uh, the temperature dependence of the size of the sizes of these peaks, basically, uh, uh, as, a, as I said, as a function of the temperature. So we have the, okay, so we have the fundamental frequency that is like remains constant. It remains constant because like, it's also like the spect spectrometer also takes the, uh, the, the, the initial pulse basically. So it's like, it's much higher than the other, uh, the other frequencies and it's like more or less constant. Uh, and then we have the third, the fifth and the seventh harmonic. So we argue that we can see within these plots that, uh, that two phase transitions are visible. First, um, uh, we follow the third harmonic and the fifth harmonic from the like room temperature going down. And you can see that they go down all the time. In contrast, the seven harmonic, so the, the, uh, like the most nonlinear response grows and it stops growing at, at the point in which we expect the transition from the strange metal to the pseudo gap. And then- in this Excuse me, uh, what is horizontal scale on the temperature? Uh, it's what do you mean? It's a it's a log plot of temperature. It's Kelvin's horizontal. Right? But 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 the distance is decrease is so 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 the zero the, the the left corner is something like 90, 90 or something like that. Uh, the left corner goes uh, to seventy eight. It's like the left corner is seventy eight. Here there is a transition at eighty eight or 89, sorry. And then the next transition at 173. 
it's the, it's more vi it's more visible on the log, log, log plot like you're so okay. it's easy to see that we have an exponential growth of harmonic yield in the superconducting phase but this transition in at 173 is more subtle and it's better visible on the log plot mm -hmm. Uh, you have no data. You have no data at lower temperatures, don't you? Oh, they didn't measure it. I, they had they had some problems with that. I don't remember what what was it. Okay, thanks. Um, okay, so in this pseudo gap uh, regime, they okay. So they are more or less constant. I mean, meaning that okay. So the third and fifth. Uh, uh, decrease a bit while the the seventh is like more or less constant and then there is exponential growth of the intensity of these harmonics below the critical temperature so of course we just look at the so from this picture we argue that we can see these two phase transitions but then if we show the the so i, I didn't say but uh the solid lines are the our theoretical fits to the data. So of course, we also needed to fit this T1 and T2 parameters, which are the scattering, like defacing, phenomenological defacing times in the different phases. And when you look, go for the, sorry, when you go for the, these fits, you can really distinguish the, the phases. Meaning like, especially with the uh, different uh, scattering, the different defacing times for the, for the correlation. Uh, so this is our argument in favor of the fact that we can really resolve this phase transition. And we also like in the experiment, they measure- But in short, these times are just the fitting parameters. There are fitting parameters, yeah. Okay. They are the only fitting parameters. Okay. Um, and the, and oh, I need to show it because it's like the other experimental uh, result which we do not model, rather like our model does not get it, is the shifts of the peaks, of the position of the peaks. So in here you can see that, at, uh, for example, for the seven harmonic, the, the peak in the ideal case should be ideally at this, but it's blue shifted to the right. So they measure this blue shift Initially, with respect to the strength of the laser, of the initial pulse, it grows a little, but it's more or less stable. But then it has some non-trivial behavior as a function of temperature, which is always blue shifted. And what does it mean? It means that there should be some strong processes, some strong electron-electron interactions that causes frequency shifts, basically. This is what it was seen before in the, like even in these perturbative regimes. And it comes from the fact that, uh, well, the, the, of the back action of the quasi-particle dynamics on the laser, of, of, the, of the emitted, uh, uh, on the emitted uh, light, basically. And our model does not get it, but like this is the future refinement in which we can get some more information from the experiment to get more information about the microscopic dynamics uh, that like are present in the sun. And that would be it. And so let, let me conclude. So the main goals of this project was to develop a purely optical methods that are compatible with various sample environments because it's all, all optical, we just shine a laser basically and to, uh, to provide probe for the, uh, let's say, uh, for quantum matter, basically, and maybe to in future create some novel platform for the attosecond technologies. And we argue that we show that the high harmonic spectrum across the uh, two phase transitions that are present in the super high temperature superconductor re reveal signatures of this phase transition and can as such they can work as this probe and we back these experimental results with the model quite simple model but yet uh, quite involved uh, which is just a two-band fermi hubbard model with a strong coupling to light 
And that would be all. The paper is in the archive in here. Here's the QR code uh, with the link to archive. And we are currently fighting with the editors and reviewers. And so thank you for the attention. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, let's thank virtually the speaker. <laughs> we cannot do much more. Uh, so now it's time, although we had some comments during the talk, it's time for questions. I have a remark which follows that of Professor Turski. I mean, it's a historical remark. You mentioned the formula which you call the Berry formula. I would like to turn your attention that this formula appeared in our book on quantum electrodynamics in which published which was published in 1975 many years before Barry noticed this fact and the book is available on our my homepage at CFT mm -hmm. on page 131 you see exactly the formula with the same notation capital D is equal to the derivative plus something which may be called the uh, addition so it makes the covariant derivative Thank you. As this is the case, we should promote it, I think. I mean, I am aware of this fact, but everybody calls it very connection. So. Well, well, me too. <laughs> me too. <I> know. <laughs> it can be checked very easily. Yeah. Yes. I'm sure. Okay. So this is the formula mm -hmm. exactly in, in, the, in our book, except that D is called alpha, mm. small d. So we'll check. Are there any other questions? I am looking at at raised hands. If I may take yes. this fundamental question, I probably missed it. Do you have a magnetization data for that sample as a function of temperature? Let me look at the supplementary materials. I do not. Sorry. Because um, that's that's a very basic thing. How much of the volume of the sample is really in the superconducting state when you lower the temperature? The whole sample is usually very low temperature, liquid helium and below, fully superconducting. And and how sharp is this transition? You can only see on magnetization data, and this is just a sort of standard in sample qualification i mean uh, i have plots with the resistivity and like resistivity have... resistivity is insignificant because it's enough to have one percolation pass to get zero but magnetization is a volume effect and it's as a story so 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 that, that, that that's the question of 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 the sample uh, sample being superconductor in the bulk volume all the way. And this is something which probably referees will point out. Sorry, I have a, it was on the next page. Sorry. It's okay. I, I have I have a squid measurement of the oh yeah of, okay, the, of the of the mag, of the magnetic and model. how does Sorry. it look like? <laughs> Show you in the camera. <laughs> oh no, this is oh <laughs> I see. But you are no, this, is, this looks okay. That looks fine. That looks fine. That looks fine. That should be no problem then. Okay. Okay, I think in the in the title of of the preprint uh, was a was a quantum phase transition, wasn't it? Yes, it's it's not. Yeah, it was. <laughs> I see. Okay, thanks. Okay, if there, are, I see a question from uh, Tae Hun Lee. So Tae, please. Um, excuse me. If I, can I ask a very elementary question? about sure. superconductor. I mean, that superconductor in, in principle, actually, theoretically, it is uh, uh, exact, actually, the exact phenomena for the vanishing the resistance or some, some sort of approximation. I mean, in principle. I mean, theoretically, like BCS theory. Or... In the BCS theory, it's right. exactly zero because it's just a superfluid scooper parse. So in any actually time interval, any uh, time scale, uh, when 
when uh, when actually electron the pair actually interact with the environment, uh, it doesn't exchange any energy, right? Yes, I mean if 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 you have an isolated system, and you have exactly BCS state, then it does not have any energy dissipation. Of course, if you couple to environment, you have like or like provide some losses, some finite, even probably finite size effects. It's never zero, really. Like, but like, internally, it actually when they even if they interact, but exchange of energy is zero. In internally, uh, exchange of the energy between what? Between the electron pair and the rest of the system. And the rest of the system. Um, because uh, the electron flow without any resistance, that means. This, 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 this is a weak coupling theory, really. So, like at the level of the Hamiltonian, you don't have any terms. But in real sample with oh, not, like real crystalline structure, then there will always be some. But theoretically, it is. Uh, uh, the energy, any energy exchange between the group uh, pair and the rest of the system is uh, must be zero, right? In theoretical. Okay, so it only is true for the system that is described by the BCS wave function, and exciting it might provide some different effects with exchange of energy. I'm, I'm not sure like whether this is like really your question. To, the, to a very good approximation, there is no exchange of energy. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So let's thank the speaker again. So that's it, thank you for, uh, for your attention.